Open your Bibles, please, in the Old Testament to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading there at verse 9. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath none to, uh, excuse me, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, Two shall withstand him, uh, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. A theme I mention quite often is the need for two, or better yet, three witnesses to confirm some thing or corroborate some charge made uh, concerning Bible issues. Uh, our text says uh, a braid or a, or a threefold cord is stronger than two. A, a braid of three is stronger than two. You can uh, fight the school bully on the playground if you take a friend with you easier than doing it yourself. And if you take two friends, that's even better. And uh, so the subject or the sermon is simply... Two or three witnesses. I know it's not flashy, um, but it's straightforward. And uh, this is going to be a key for you to become a great Bible student in the future. This is essential. Um, two or three witnesses to confirm something is the Bible rule. And I, I hope you pay attention. Try to take some notes of try to be as clear as I can. But this principle is so important, it's surprising how little emphasis it gets by most Christians and even a lot of preachers. They neglect it. In Genesis chapter 41, uh, Joseph has been captured uh, into Egypt. And he's in a slave house, a prison, in Egypt. And he correctly interprets the dreams of two of Pharaoh's servants who are also cast into the prison. Well, Pharaoh has a dream that troubles him. He wakes up in the middle of the night and they call for Joseph because he heard Joseph was able to interpret dreams. Joseph comes in <clears throat> and uh, here's Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh's dream went uh, like this. He had, he, he dreamt of seven fat, healthy cattle, and they were all overtaken by seven sickly, diseased-looking cattle. And the, and the sick ones didn't get any better by eating the healthy ones, and it troubled them. And then the dream came to him again in a different form. Seven full, healthy ears of corn appeared to him, and they were later overtaken by seven sickly uh, uh, looking ears of corn and uh, the se seven were still bad afterwards and he didn't know what to make of it and the magicians of Egypt couldn't interpret to him so Joseph said the dream uh, is is one he said God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do Genesis 41 verse 25 Seven healthy, seven good, full years of prosperity would be followed by seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh's giving some time to prepare for the time of famine. Um, but the Lord begins formally. So, so the dream was uh, repeated to Pharaoh that night for emphasis. God's showing 
Pharaoh what he's getting ready to do, giving him a chance to prepare for the seven bad years when they finally come. But the Lord begins giving a command that two or three witnesses would be necessary to confirm things. And that's a great uh, story to illustrate the principle there in Genesis 41. Uh, we read, Whoso killeth any man, or excuse me, any person, um, the murderer shall surely be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against a person to cause him to die. And that's found in, Genesis, uh, in Numbers 35, verse 30. That's the first reference. If you want to write these references down, um, I should have mentioned that. Numbers 35, verse 30. Uh, next, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, God repeats almost the same command of two witnesses, but this time he adds a third one. If you can find a third one, that makes the case even stronger against a murderer. And then in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, later, he applies this principle of two or three uh, to someone charged with any crime, someone accused of any crime, not just murder. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Matthew 18, verse 16, Christ says to take a second person with you when you have to confront a third person over some controversy so that every word may be established. Matthew 18, verse 16. And in Matthew 18, verse 20, the Lord told his disciples, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Two or three people gathered in Jesus' name to worship the Lord God constitutes a church. That's the beginning of a church. Churches have to begin somewhere. They don't all begin uh, like Joel Osteen with you know, 40,000 unsaved people in a sports arena. John chapter 8, verse 17. Christ reminds the Jews that, the, that, that this was the historic rule for their nation two or three witnesses to prove something. And they knew it. In John 8, verse 17, or I'm sorry, I, I gave you that. Uh, the Apostle Paul invokes this principle of two or three witnesses needed when he wrote to the Corinthians that he was planning to come see them a third time. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. This is the third time I'm coming to you that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. He says, also, don't believe an accusation made against a spiritual elder based on one person's word. But he says, before two or three witnesses. Otherwise, it's hearsay. It's gossip. And that's not what the true believer is supposed to be engaged in. And he wrote that... Um, Two or three witnesses was, had always been the law under Moses. When he mentions it in Hebrews chapter 10, verse, uh, um, not Hebrews 10, uh, yeah, Hebrews 10, verse 28. Hebrews 10, verse 28. The previous one about not believing one charge against an elder, that was in 1 Timothy 5, verse 19. I'm sorry, I, I failed to give that to you. Those are the main suggestions, the main references of two or three witnesses. There may be many more. And as you read through your Bible, you'll find references, you'll find instances that simply are clearly a case of two or three testimonies or witnesses to prove something or corroborate some charge made against someone or some claim made. Both uh, legal matters, someone being charged with murder or crime, Old Testament, and uh, New Testament issues, um, fellowship, and uh, discipline and instruction among believers. That's found in both Testaments. And uh, like I say, there may be more. And if you find more that I maybe missed, bring it to my attention. I'd like to know about them. 
But this, there can be no doubt that this is an ironclad rule in the Word of God. This, I, I'm convinced, and the more I thought about this this week, I'm convinced this will transform your thinking as a Bible reader and a Bible student. This will revolutionize the way you approach Scripture and, uh, and pay closer attention to what's being said or what someone else has told you and see if it matches anything in the Scriptures at all. But um, <clears throat> the, the rule of two or three witnesses will transform the way you look at subjects in the Word of God. You won't just take one person's interpretation of a verse and figure, well, they must be right because they're, they're a nice person and I trust them. You can't do that. You can't do that. Solomon wrote, two are better than one in our text, and he implied uh, three are better than two in our text. So the more the better, the more the merrier. There's strength in numbers. We have all these expressions talking about uh, how we ought to depend on others. The Bible says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 11, verse 14. If the uh, requirement of two or three witnesses, or even more if you can find them, is this important, uh, let's try to illustrate it. Let's Let's look at a few examples to reinforce the idea in our own minds. The Lord Jesus um, I'm trying to read my own handwriting. It's not working out very well. <laughs> the Lord Jesus made sure he had two or at least three testimonies of his own authority, um, witnesses to his acclaim his power, his authority by God. Uh, there was the preaching of John the Baptist uh, and his testimony of Christ as a forerunner and the things that Christ said about himself, my father has sent me into the world, and uh, the things other people had been saying about him, testifying of his preaching. But Christ didn't accept these as uh, strong enough because they could all be interpreted as the opinions of men. And they could be rejected as the words of men. And so Christ had three divine, uh, three divine voices speaking of him. He had the divine voice of the Father at his baptism. This is my beloved Son, uh, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. He had the, the uh, testimony of the Holy Spirit landing on him at his baptism in the form of a dove. He had the testimony of the miracles he was performing. Um, things that, that had to be by the hand of the direction of God himself. And we might add a fourth. He had the testimony of the scriptures prior to that from the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets and the writings. Uh, John chapter 5 verse 46. Um, example number one, I want to call to your attention. The Lord told Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Genesis 22, verse 2. That's the very first verse where the word love occurs in the Bible. Thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. And uh, the context there is a father's love for his son, uh, whom everything was depending upon. Abraham's future, his future reputation was resting on the life of Isaac in the future. And here God tells him to sacrifice his son. Uh, this is, 
It's hard to imagine a test more difficult than to be told to slay your child when your future rests on that child, that son's uh, life in the future, life ahead. And uh, so he, he did so, was willing to do so, and Isaac was willing to submit to Abraham. Secondly, Christ said, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things unto his hand. John 3, verse 35. And thirdly, Christ said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. John 10, verse 17. Those three texts illustrate something we should never forget. Now, the subject of love includes so much more than simply a father and a son. But they show the, the first definition of love, the first epitome, a standard of love in the Word of God is the love that a father has for his son. It's not a husband and wife. It's not a mother and children. It is the love that a father has for his only son and the willingness to even sacrifice that son for the benefit of others, for the sake of others, in order to please God. I'm so happy the Lord doesn't ask us to do things like that to please him, to show our obedience to him. Some things we think are difficult for us to do or challenging for us to do are nothing compared to what Abraham was asked to do. And uh, the sacrifice Job, the sacrifices I should say Job made, losing his, his uh, children, all of his cattle and livestock and all of his possessions, being overrun by enemies, having a wife that just does nothing but complain, and then be covered with sore boils from head to toe. It's hard to imagine some guy going through that, but he said, uh, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And uh, it's hard to imagine believing in God and following his words that closely and that uh, diligently that uh, he would be pleased with you. But that's a, that was a tall test to come out at the end uh, and still be pleased or still be pleasing to God. But uh, sometimes you read, sometimes you read, um, you know, Smith and Sons, um, air conditioning, heating business, Smith and Sons, plumbing uh, or electrical work. Um, and it, apply, it sort of suggests a, a family bond that's taking place, holding the business together behind the scenes. And it's been going on for some time. You never read about three sisters' kitchen creations. Uh, <laughs> you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen anyway. That's what they say. But um, two women can show up for something wearing the same outfit, the same dress, and it, like Dr. Ruckman would say, it's hell on wheels. <laughs> they fight and argue what you have. Um, and women probably have to overcome a lot if they join the army, the military, being told what to wear and uh, dressing the same as all other uh, female uh, soldiers. But uh, men can all be wearing the same uniform, the same coat, the same ties, the same buttons, the same everything. And they're sort of individual units. They're not offended because the next guy is wearing the same thing. <laughs> Can't imagine some guy being offended. You've got my outfit on. <laughs> but um, the Bible says there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 1 John 5, 
verse 7. That's the clearest verse on the Trinity, clearest definition of the Trinity in the Word of God. And that verse is missing from all modern translations. They just skip from verse 6 to verse 8 and uh, don't even print verse 7 in the modern translations. Someone's trying to undermine the nature and the essence of the Holy Trinity and the person of Christ. They're trying to undermine his blood. They're trying to undermine his miracles. Um, the dying thief says, uh, Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, not Lord. They take the lordship out of the sinner's mouth right at the moment he's trying to get saved. And that's what's, those are just a couple of clues as to what's wrong with modern version of the Bible. But two or three witnesses is the Bible's requirement, and you and I should never forget that. All right, example number two. Christ told Simon Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, verse 18. For 1,500 years, the Roman Catholic Church has interpreted that to mean that's where Jesus was making Simon Peter the first pope or the preeminent bishop over all Christians, which would soon follow in the new church. But uh, if that's so, then it's fair for us to ask them to give us at least a second and even a third reference from the Bible to confirm that belief before we feel obligated to agree with them. But that idea is still being debated by Catholics and Protestants uh, here in 2021. Why it would still be debated between them now is a little mysterious because it's crystal clear it had nothing to do with Peter and the papacy centuries ago. But some Protestants are real slow learners. And um, there's almost a second reference in Matthew chapter uh, 8, verse 29, because the, the account of Peter, thou art the Christ, and Jesus talking to him is found there. But in Mark's account, there's no mention of Christ elevating Peter. There's no mention of him being made the first pope at all. And so, and everyone agrees that whatever Mark learned about the ministry of Christ, he learned from Simon Peter. Uh, Mark, sometimes we call him John Mark, based on Acts chapter 12, he learned about the life of Christ from Peter before he wrote his uh, epistle. And so uh, if he wasn't told that Peter was the Pope, evidently po uh, Peter hadn't told him, hadn't instructed him that he was also the Pope. You have to submit to me. And we should expect uh, all the other disciples in the New Testament to recognize Peter and acknowledge him as the head of the church. But none of them ever do. At the end of the Gospel of John, Peter is worried about what John's going to do. What shall this man do? And Christ said, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. You, you let him and I deal with each other and you mind your own business, is what the Lord Jesus told Peter. So instead of having two or more witnesses to Peter being the Pope, the Catholic Church doesn't even have one. All they have is their own opinion of what Matthew 16, verse 18 means. And it was Simon Peter who said, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. 2 Peter 1, verse 20. And that's all they've ever had. And um, so you can write off the idea of Peter and the papacy as a, being a heresy. It has nothing to do with knowing God or the Lord Jesus at all. Now, example number three I'll bring to your attention. Christ told a paralyzed man, Mark chapter 2, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And the scribes who were present accused him of blasphemy, asking, Who can forgive sins but God only? Christ heard, Christ knew what they were saying under their breath about him. 
And he said, which is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or say to the crippled man, take up thy bed and walk? Well, it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, because who could prove they were, or who could prove they weren't? He says, but that you might know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. And he says to the crippled man, um, I say unto thee, take up thy bed and walk. And the lame man got up off his uh, laying down off his cot, uh, legs, ankles, able to walk, uh, picked up his bed and left the left the meeting and uh, left for, forgiven by Christ and healed physically. And the Lord Jesus said, that's the test. If you can do the one, you can do the other. And if I can forgive, if I can heal a sick, then there's a pretty good chance you know I can forgive sins too. And uh, that account is also given a second time uh, in Matthew chapter 9. And you don't know any Roman Catholic priest who's ever uh, healed crippled people and get them up on their feet before they go into the confessional and tell him their dirty laundry. And you're not going to hear of one. They've been moving themselves along for centuries, uh, preying on the ignorance of church members who don't know the Bible and uh, are not even interested in reading the Bible or confirming what they're being taught. Uh, there's a church in this area, and I, I may have told you about this. They have a big statue of Mary on the rooftop as you go into the front of the church. And underneath the, the statue, there's a banner it looks like someone's hands are spread out like this. And the, the slogan says, Come gather yourselves to the great uh, feast of God. Revelation uh, 19, verse uh, 15, I think, I think it is. That has, and, of course, they're implying this is an invitation for people to come to our Catholic Mass, the wine and the wafer. But uh, it has nothing to do with the wine and the wafer. You read that verse in the book of Revelation, you'll see that's God calling out to the birds of prey and the flesh-eating vultures and crows to come eat the dead flesh of all the soldiers he wipes out at the Battle of Armageddon. Has nothing to do with going to Catholic Mass. But I told someone when I saw that banner a few months ago, I said, that banner will be up there for four or five months before they decide to take it down and put a new one up. And I promise you, not one person at this church will inquire as to what that verse actually says in the New Testament. This is a perpetual ignorance. People who are ignorant, um, the person who made the sign, the person who reads it, not a single one of them cares what it actually says and whether it's taken out of context or not. It's very unfortunate. The Lord told, um, uh, told some, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own traditions. Matthew 7, verse 9. And that's, uh, and that's basically what people do. They take one verse and put an interpretation on it and assume that's all there is to it. That's how you study the Bible. Um, so a priest forgiving your sins in a broom closet at church is a heresy. Now, example number four. What about groups like Mormons and the Watchtower Society, JWs? One verse they both use, and they use it the same way, so I'm going to include them together. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Surely the Lord God uh, will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets, a secret rather, unto, the, unto his servants the prophets. That's Amos 3, verse 7. They, they appeal to this verse to justify having a, a, a human man as their church prophet or their leadership, you know, Jehovah's divine organization. And the idea that God's kingdom would be headquartered in Salt Lake City uh, or in Brooklyn, New York. 
how many heard the story of uh, Beth Serim over the years? You've heard me talk about it, anyone? Brother Lee and I, you've heard it, Tracy? Oh, yeah, Beth Serim. Um, back in 1929, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society built a house in San Diego. Um, I can, I almost have the address memorized because <laughs> we've 444 uh, uh, four, Brayburn Court, San Diego, California. But Beth Serim was Hebrew, meaning the house of the princes. And they put out a story in their magazines that Christ was going to return and a great kingdom would ensue on the earth. And this house, uh, all these saints from the book of Hebrews chapter 11 would be resurrected. And this house was intended for them to live in uh, like a four or five bedroom home, swimming pool, nice uh, Spanish uh, Mediterranean architecture. Brother Lee and his wife and my wife and I, we traveled down there about 16 years ago. I wanted to see the house firsthand. It's still there. And it created quite a stir in 1929. Um, and and uh, so the city of San Diego put a plaque on the front of the house, right next to the front door. Beth Serim, House of Princes, 1929, historic site, whatever the number is. Um, and uh, the, the only person who ever lived in the house was their religious, or their religion's president, Joseph Rutherford. Um, in 1929, this was a mansion that uh, other homes around the neighborhood can't even compare to. And this was the beginning of the Great Depression. Uh, the only person who ever lived in the house was Joseph Rutherford, their president. And the reason he lived there is because in his declining years, their president, Joseph Rutherford, was an alcoholic. And uh, we put a picture on the website years ago. We need to update some of that information of him sitting down uh, with some other men, drinking a few cold beers to celebrate the end of prohibition. Um, and I read an article by a, uh, that said the local uh, pharmacy, where they used to sell liquor, said he was one of their best customers in 1929. So the only person that ever lived in that house was Rutherford, because from San Diego back to Brooklyn, New York, you couldn't get any farther away in the United States. They want to keep him out of sight while other people ran, ran the church uh, organization back in New York. Um, these are little, some of these dirty little secrets of groups they don't want you to know about. But fortunately, we know about them. <laughs> and we're willing to tell. But there are at least two witnesses, I'll give you three, testifying to the fact that we don't need um, man to reveal God to us like the Old Testament prophets. Now, that was the case in the Old Testament times when Amos wrote, God would reveal things to the prophet who would then disseminate it to the nation, Israel or Judah. And it's always an Old Testament text they choose. They always choose some Old Testament text that's uh, really obsolete. Uh, it's not relevant to day-to-day -day living for the New Testament saint. Um, something that happened before the birth of Christ, before um, the, his ministry, before his miracles, before his death, his burial, his resurrection, before the New Testament church, before the filling of the disciples with the Holy Spirit uh, and the Apostle Paul's ministry, uh, all of those things hadn't taken place yet when uh, the so-called truth of cults uh, wants to be uh, repeated. But Christ, I'll give you three examples why we would re reject that idea. Christ told Peter, blessed art thou Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 16, verse 17. 
Peter's revelation there in Matthew 16 didn't require an Old Testament prophet to tell him anything. Paul writes in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake before in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, that, well, that might theoretically match the Mormon's idea, but it says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. The voice of the Lord Jesus Christ is greater and supersedes the voice of the prophets of old. And the Apostle John writes, But the anointing which ye have, which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. Um, but as the same anointing, the Holy Spirit, uh, teacheth you all things, uh, and is truth, and, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. 1 John 2, verse 27. There's at least three texts right there saying we're not dependent on men to interpret God's words to us. Um, you and I have more than the Old Testament saints ever had. No Old Testament saint had the Holy Spirit living in him permanently. He would come in, he would empower uh, and inspire the, the writers and the prophets, but he could come and go. David prayed, uh, Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So there was always that possibility. If you weren't walking close to the uh, desires of God. But you and I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and uh, never to leave. You're never going to leave at all. It's amazing that some guy is a rascal and has no interest in God, has no desire for the word of God. Uh, he's living a carnal life. But somewhere, somebody led him to Christ. He got off base and he never began to grow. But if that guy meant business with Christ, he's born again. It's hard for me to imagine that. It's hard to, to look at someone like that and accept him as a fellow saint. But the grace of God is greater than my grace. And uh, thankfully, uh, I'm not the judge. But the believer doesn't need human uh, prophets to teach him. He trusts the, the uh, power of the, the words of God, and he trusts the influence of the Holy Spirit to stir the hearts of other people and to inspire and instruct him as he reads the Bible. I mean, if you have the third person of the Godhead living inside of you, and bearing witness as you read the book, what more do you need? How could some pope outdo that? How could some Mormon leader outdo that? So a modern day Mormon prophet is a heresy. And you and I reject that idea. Lastly, example number five, we'll deal with some of the brethren. And when I say that, I mean Pentecostals, Charismatics. And I say brethren because over my lifetime, uh, I've known and still know some Pentecostal believers who love the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, in many ways are more devoted than I am. Um, it's just that they're not too bright in the scriptures. They're not too bright in reading the Word of God and paying close attention. Um, the Pentecostal church began back in, the, rather the movement, began back in 1901, 120 years ago, in Topeka, Kansas. A young, young woman named Agnes Osmond began to speak in some gibberish, nonsensical verbiage at some religious meeting, and they all interpreted that to mean this is the return of the Holy Spirit and the ability to speak in tongues, 
found in the book of Acts. And it's returned in the, new, in the latter times. when God said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh in the latter days. And they interpreted that to mean that fulfillment. Um, de denominations like the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, uh, the Four Square Group, and multitudes of other smaller groups all sprang out of that movement. Slick uh, con men uh, like Oral Roberts, he was a charlatan from the beginning, a two-bit phony fake. Um, I'll, I'll give you a personal story I, because I know this is going to go out on the Internet. I want people to see this by a couple of thousand this coming week. Uh, I was working for a funeral home 22 years ago here in Ontario, and we had a man pass. He was um, about the same age as my father at the time. His son was my age. But the man had osteoporosis so pronounced, he was bent over like this and walked facing the ground around Ontario. He walked that way 40 years. He never could straighten up. His curvature of the spine was so severe. And uh, when, and this is graphic, but it's public knowledge, so I, I guess I'm okay. Uh, when he was being viewed at the funeral home, to lay him back in the casket had the appearance of a man sitting up on the sofa watching television or something. There's no way to straighten his body. It had been contorted like that for 40 years. His son told me, you know, Mike, I know that looks, looks strange, but that's the way I remember my dad. I said, you don't have to explain it to me. We see a lot of strange things in this business. The next day at the little church here in town, his funeral, who should show up at the funeral but Oral Roberts and his wife, Evelyn. This man was Evelyn Roberts' younger brother. And he had walked around Ontario in that condition for decades. And the little Pentecostal church he went to, you know, some church that believes and name it and claim it and God will heal you if you demand it, uh, never could do anything about it. And his pastor didn't even know that he was Oral Roberts' brother-in-law. Oral Roberts and his wife show up to the funeral. Oral Roberts himself had just had eye surgery, so he was recovering from an eye procedure. The most famous healing evangelist in the world had been unable to do anything for his brother-in-law in well over 40, 45 years. That told me this guy is a fake. He's a phony two-bit baloney, you know, con man. And, um, and people should pay closer attention. These guys, I remember when Oral Roberts would talk about God wants you to be uh, wealthy. Uh, my, um, I pray that Thou mayest prosper even as thy soul prospereth. He wrote to, um, the Bible says in the book of Second John. But, uh, and Oral Roberts thought that meant uh, God wants everyone to be wealthy in this life. And he would put out, that's the interpretation. God wants men to be wealthy and healthy in this life. Um, we got a letter from Sherry Sass when she and Ed moved back East, and uh, I had never received a letter quite like this one, and it began this way. Uh, it says, she started out saying, I hope this letter finds you uh, all in good health at this time of the year. And I thought, that's what, that's what John meant. He wanted his readers to be healthy when they received this letter and trusted that they were in good shape. But the idea that God wants everyone to be uh, healed and to be healthy and wealthy and prosper financially, if they just tuck in their love gift prayer partners, uh, <laughs> that uh, that's what God meant. No, that's not at all what he meant. 
So they'll take a, a phrase or a verse and put their own interpretation on it and ignore anything else in the Bible that might get in the way. They make outrageous claims that uh, don't even begin with Scripture. God wants everyone healthy. God wants everyone to speak in tongues. And never mind two or three witnesses. They don't even search for one to base their many of their beliefs on. And then you had Paul and Jan Crouch, uh, that queer, and that and that harlot wife, and uh, she she probably been around the bunkhouse with so many guys. That, and by the way, little Matt Crouch, who's running TBN now, he's not even Paul's son. He was, a, he was an illegitimate son between Jan and some bodybuilder she had an affair with decades ago. Um, he's lucky because there's a similarity in the, the appearance. So he passes himself off as Paul's son. He had an older brother that was Paul's son, but he and his daughter worked for TBN and they were asking too many questions about how the money is being spent. And so Paul and Jan fired them, fired his own son and granddaughter from the ministry. I think Paul paid himself $700,000 a year. Jan paid herself $300,000 a year. It's a nice work if you can get it. I was going to see if they needed a helper, but uh, apparently they didn't. But they make outrageous claims, you know, uh, send in your love gift this month and we'll send you a little vial of water that comes from the Jordan River, uh, dear prayer partners, or we'll send you a thing with some sand in it that comes from the land of Israel. Uh, there's, no, there's no limit to the stuff they would hawk and sell in the name of Christ and in the name of the Word of God. It had nothing to do with the Word of God at all. And so, rather than two or three witnesses, they don't even come up with one. They don't even, they're not even trying. Um, 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 for time's sake, I'm going to move along here. But the idea that God wants you to speak in tongues or that that woman jibber-jabbering in 1901 was speaking in tongues is false. Let me say this. Nobody in the New Testament ever spoke in tongues. Nobody. Nobody ever spoke in tongues. The Bible says they spake with tongues. As if it's a foreign language and you're in control of it. See, if you're speaking with tongues, you're controlling it. But if you're speaking in tongues, something else is controlling you. That's the distinction. But like I said a little bit ago, the, the Pentecostal movement had trouble reading English. Um, and they come up with crazy ideas. Uh, let me jump ahead here. Um, so when the foreign languages were listed in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, and uh, none of the Pentecostals started speaking with foreign languages, they decided that they're speaking in unknown tongues, which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, but that argument doesn't help their case. When the King James translators needed to add a word to a sentence, to smooth out the meaning of the sentence, they would print that extra word in italics. So you knew, as a reader, that they had added it. And the word unknown is found six times in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And all six times, it's italicized. Unknown tongues. Unknown tongues. And the, the point is, if you're speaking a foreign language, but the person hearing you um, is unfamiliar with it, to them, uh, it's unknown because they don't know it. It's a, it's a knowable language, but none of them happen to know it. And uh, I know that Pentecostal, uh, Pentecostals don't believe 
uh, their own rhetoric because whenever a Pentecostal missionary uh, gets ready to go to a foreign language, he has to study the language before he can go to that country. He doesn't have the sudden ability to speak Swahili so he can go speak to the people lost in that land. So they need to practice what they preach. But um, we move along here. We're almost done. Just think of the nonsense that's been done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Pentecostal charismatics. And like I say, one of, part of their problem is they're not too... They can read and write well enough to drive a motor vehicle, hold down a job, um, I suppose pay their taxes as they should, etc. But uh, when it comes to reading the Word of God, they're slipshod and they really don't care about details. I uh, heard a minister come two different times at my day job last year, and uh, for two different funerals, he would read the scriptures that uh, this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immorality. I thought, what kind of moron are you? And he was the preacher. This mortal must put on immorality. But, but in many areas, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics, they don't even try. They're not even looking for two or three witnesses. Here's how most Pentecostal preachers start their sermons. Good morning, everybody. You know, the Lord spoke to me this morning, and he said this, that, or the other. <laughs> this is how they begin. You know, the Lord, the Lord was telling me this morning that this is what I should say. That's how they proceed. It's really easy to imitate them, to mimic them. All you do is make it up. <laughs> but um, God says, uh, or rather, God, they say God saves you, but you can unsave yourself if you're not careful. I worked with a Pentecostal guy when we were first married. He was one of the only guys there that I, I he was a preacher down in Corona. One, a preacher, the only few guys at the whole workplace I had a little semblance of fellowship with. So on lunchtime, we'd go out together and go down to AM, PM, get a couple of big drinks. And so, um, and then he proceeds to tell me what he thinks of Baptists. So well, you Baptists, you believe once saved, always saved, so you can do whatever you want to do and, uh, and not lose your salvation. And uh, I had to shake my head. I said, you know something? Uh, I've heard a lot of preachers over the years, over the decades growing up, and I've never heard one in my life say such an idiotic thing that you just said. I've never heard one, and I, I doubt you've ever heard one. And uh, eventually I told, I told him, I think you're upset because you don't know the scriptures. He was a nice guy, like I say, but uh, they, they think they're free to tell you their opinion of you and your convictions, um, but they, they couldn't base it on any scripture. They had no testimony. God wants you to speak in tongues. No, he doesn't. God wants you to be healed all the time. No, he doesn't. You should read what, what uh, God said to Moses, who hath made man's mouth or his uh, tongue? Uh, have not I, saith the Lord? Not everybody speaks eloquently. Not everybody uh, has the same gift, the same ability. Some people, I believe, are lame and infirm and crippled. It sounds shocking to say because God wants them to be that way. There's no other way around it. God wants you to be rich and prosper in this life. No, he doesn't. He may let you, but doesn't. there's nothing in the Bible telling you that this is his desire for everybody. You can't take this idea that God wants you to succeed and prosper financially and be wealthy. You can't take that message to some tribal place in Africa 
or in the far east or places where people are poor down in South America. You can't take that message there. How would that re be received? God promises to heal you every time. No, he doesn't. And the best, like I said, the best evidence that they don't even believe what they preach is that their missionaries have to study the languages first before they travel to those other countries. The Bible says, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. And uh, two or three witnesses is the rule. It's ironclad. And you and I can't avoid it or escape it. We should embrace it and use it to guide our thinking and teaching. When someone proposes something, double check they've got a second, at least a second solid testimony for it. And even a third if they can come up with it. If they can't, just write them off and ignore them because they're going to be unprofitable to you. Uh, all right, I've, I've rambled a little bit. Let's uh, bow for prayer, and we'll conclude for today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those that are here today, and uh, we pray, God, that this will have been instructive and helpful. Um, be our teacher and guide. Let the Holy Spirit move upon our minds and our convictions and hearts and consciences, and we'll thank you for that, uh, Lord, as we start a new year. Uh, we say, even so come, Lord Jesus. We're not interested in facing another year like the last one. We want to see the Savior who loved us enough to die for our sake and to be with him for eternity. And we'll pray to this end in Jesus' name. Amen.